Hey everybody, DDO players, and we are privileged today to be speaking with the one and the only Justin DeWitt. Hello everybody, it's me, just the one me. <laughs> just the one you. <laughs> and of course, we all know, well I hope you all know, Justin DeWitt is from Fireside Games. He is the developer and owner, is that your official title? Uh, technically I'm called the Chief Creative Officer, which pretty much describes what you just said. Yeah, lead, lead designer <laughs> and uh, co-owner, yeah, with my wife Anne-Marie. Mm-hmm. It's, that just sounds more fancy when you say it. Doesn't it? Doesn't say it, though? It that, like a tie. It's better than a business card, right? <laughs> <laughs> So let's talk about Fireside Games a little bit. Uh, what's the history of that? How did that come about? Ah, yes. Many moons ago, yeah. Um, so it came about through a variety of things. Um, I had always been into making games, even as a kid. Uh, just always it's been sort of a hobby of mine. Uh, it fell out of that for a while while I was in, involved with falling in love with video games and then making video games for a while. But I played uh, Settlers of Catan back in 2000, and it just reignited my love for games. And it's kind of a sickness. If you ever talk to another designer, you can't really shut it off. It's just something we do. So I was, you know, on the weekends and evenings fiddling around. I'd put a game away for six months, pick it up later. And finally, um, some ideas started getting fairly playable, and people liked them, and they wanted to play them more and more. So um, we knew we had something interesting. People wanted to play, as they called it, that Castle game, which was an early version of Castle Panic. Uh, we set aside some money and started looking at what it was going to take to start the company. I ended up working briefly, well, not briefly, for a couple of years with uh, Steve Jackson Games, um, learning a lot about the industry and all that. And then we decided we were going to launch Fireside on our own, take a whim, you know, do the big risk, go ahead and make our own company and launch uh, Castle Panic the old-fashioned way. This was back in, like, 2008, I think, was when we incorporated it, and we sent files off to press and all that. And then um, in 2009, Castle Panic Panic came out, and it was right away um, really successful. We were shocked. We were told when we worked with our fulfillment company that we probably had enough um, we probably could have printed about 700 or so for like the good chunk of the year because you know a new game, unknown designer, and we ended up we had to go with 3,500. That was the smallest print run we could do. We blew through that in 10 weeks. So that wow, was, yeah, that was pretty good. We basically <laughs> spent the next few years trying to keep up with that demand and make more games and all that. But that's where it all started. Uh, Castle Bank first game out in 2009. Um, since then, I think I've lost track. I think we're up to 13 games that are still in print. Um, I may be wrong on that, but it's keeping us busy. It's uh, now both myself and Anne-Marie, it's our full-time job. We have another employee who's a production artist and a part-time person who takes care of our customer service, and it's a great team. We're growing all the time and having a blast. I mean, we're living the dream, so to speak. (laughs) And it amazes me that you are about the third, maybe, designer I've talked to that has mentioned Settlers of Catan got them back into it or oh, re- yeah. reignited the spark. And it's the same for, like, people that get into just playing in the hobby, too. Yep. So Catan has done so much for this hobby. It, just, it really has. It's crazy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's so well done and so accessible that you can't help but play it and have that moment of, I didn't know you could do this with, you know, dice and cardboard and pieces. Right, and, yeah. And, and I'll play it with, you know, my f- friends of my parents who are not gamers in any way, shape, or form, and you just watch that moment in their eyes like, that was different. I've never done that, you know, and that's that's beautiful. And then the game does it so well. It was so accessible, and it hit at the perfect time when people were really, there, there was nothing else like it, really. The only other games I can even think of, I mean, you might have been able to get a hold of Carcassonne back then, maybe, if you really knew somebody or you were really clever at finding a game store, but it was the right game, right time, and we owe a lot to that game and all the people that helped them put it out where it is. And you kind of touched on it briefly, but let's go into a little bit more of your history of game development. Mm-hmm. Uh, you kind of said, you know, when you were a kid, you kind of liked to design games. Is that kind of where you got the spark at, or was yeah. it a little bit later on? No, I was pretty little. I mean, I remember making a really bad handmade version of... Um, uh, uh, Stratego for my mom for Christmas one year. I was so excited that it had these really terrible little cardboard pieces that were, you know, colored with magic marker and stuff. And she just thought it was adorable because that's what moms do. But I loved the idea of of making games. So um, as I got a little older, I started making my own rules. And there were usually it was an experience I wanted to have. Like I remember making a Star Trek game where I wanted to have Klingons shoot the Enterprise and go back and forth. And there really wasn't a game you could go buy. There were some really primitive computer simulations, but I wanted a paper one. And then for me, one of the pivotal moments, I've said this in some other interviews, but um, I went and saw Tron back in whatever, 80, 82, I forget when it came out. And I came home and I was so excited. The next day I was like, Mom, Mom, can we go to you know the local toy store? I want to get the, the Tron game because I'm sure there was a Tron game. And I went out and there wasn't. There were no Tron games. 
I was a stone lug, but but I want to drive a light cycle. And so we came home <laughs> yeah. and I made my own light cycle game. I cut out all these little pieces and basically you would leave a light trail behind you and you'd roll dice to move. It was great. You moved on a grid. It was super, super easy. But like the game designer in me, even then, watch that, you know, the only like, what, 30 seconds or whatever it's on the screen. I was immediately like, I want to make a game of that. And that's just how it was when I was a kid. I would get obsessed with weird ideas. I made a helicopter games because there weren't games out there that did what I wanted. But board games were kind of you know, beyond their infancy back then. There were a few really extreme, you know, I think Avalon Hill might have had a few games back then in like the, the 80s and all that, but you weren't going to bump into those at a, a Walgreens or anything like that. Um, uh, and then it was, you know, all your classic Hasbro stuff. And I wanted something different and fell in love with that for a while. And like I said, kind of put it aside for a while to do the video game thing. And then the spark was back and it turns out I still had that sickness. Couldn't turn that off either. <laughs> So is is that just where it starts? Like you will see something or you'll maybe you read a book or you're watching TV or a movie and you think, hey, that would make a killer game. <laughs> a lot of times, yeah. It, inspiration can be very weird. Like sometimes it'll be a matter of, ooh, I just watched this this situation happen. Maybe it's a movie or a book. And you're like, I want to say, can I make a game out of that? Yeah. What if you were this guy and this happened? But um, other times it'll be like a mechanic. You'll think about, oh, you know what? I really would be cool is if you had a card that when you turned it this way, it did this. When you turned it this way did that oh i wonder if i can make a game out of that usually for me though theme and mechanics come very much at the same time so like i'll be you know um watching a, a movie or something and go oh that one scene was so cool i'd love to do that just like i did with the tron one way back when i was a kid you'll get like inspired by that one moment and you think about okay well what are the rules that like were going on in that adventure they were having and what are the limitations what were the assets they had to work with what were the resources and it very quickly becomes something you can kind of gamify in your head the hard part is of course you can't do a simulation. You have to abstract some things and simplify other things. You can't put all the details in there unless you want to play some kind of advanced squad leader kind of thing that has all the numbers. So <laughs> right. That's not really my jam, though. So. so, yeah, it's pushing on those kind of things and looking for what tickles your fancy. Like when I always tell the story of uh, when I was working on uh, Castle Panic, it went through a, a couple of quick variations before I realized um, defending a castle was going to work really, really well. The other versions of the game had complications. And right about that time, the last two Lord of the Rings movies were coming out. And those giant battles at the end of those two movies were just so epic. And also, they were so soul-crushing. The guys are looking out over an ocean of bad guys. And they're just thinking, "This we're never going to get out of this alive. We're doomed. And my sick brain goes, yeah, I want to make my players do that. <laughs> <laughs> that so much that right there. yes that is what i want to do so there can be those moments like that where the light just clicks and you're immediately like ooh, i want to make a game of that so what's the hardest part of that then like you you have this idea you maybe write it down on paper or whatever you do so what is the process and what's the hardest part of actually turning that into cardboard and pieces right getting it on the table yeah yeah there's multiple parts one of the problems is the time it takes um uh games are fun but it's hard to make a really good game quick um uh so i have a backlog of games right now that haunt me in my sleep because i haven't been able to get to them because it's taking so long to do all this other stuff but um yeah the overall process usually for me is like okay i get some kind of a concept and like you said i'll make a note just so i don't forget because i come up with these things in the middle of the night or whatever and i gotta jot something down and then you go back and you revisit and you really need to kind of take a, a really critical eye and look at what are you trying to do and is that really going to be fun and nine times out of ten it is this is a neat thing i want to see how this goes so i'll do sort of like thought experiments where i'll play it through in my head of like okay if this guy played this card and it did this how would i respond or what piece would i have to move to simulate this effect and you start kind of like mentally picturing in your head and uh sometimes you'll get to a point where you go yeah this is this isn't working this is a dumb idea and either change it or throw it out or start over and other times you'll hit it and go yeah this is good i like that i want to see what happens when my flipping this card makes him flip that card or whatever and then there's a point where you got to go real world prototype so you'll grab some paper and scribble things out i mean i'm looking at the one right in front right now it is literally hand cut pieces of paper with my terrible handwriting and what are supposed to be icons scribbled on it and the sad thing is i have a degree in graphic design illustration these should look a lot better, but I didn't spend much time on them. <laughs> so you've got something now in front of you. It's got it's got your symbols. It's got your numbers on it. And now you start playing it, and you immediately are like, oh, I was right. This is a terrible idea. Or this would work so much better if I changed these seven things. And you just start basically hitting your head against it. Um, you, you start refining uh, uh, what, what the game wants to do and what you want the game to do. There's a little bit of a battle there. And then also, what's the fun part? How do I make this more fun, not less fun? Where do I, I want to add versus subtract? Um, does it need more of something? Does it need less of something? something and a lot of times for me i'll go down an alley i'll be like hmm this would be great but i think all the greens should be blues let's change all the greens to blues play it a few times either i was right or i'm wrong and i either go back and start over or you keep pushing and that's that work takes a while but a lot of times 
going down those blind alleys of trying a new variation will sometimes you'll find jewels and you hold on to that jewel and then take it back and go the other way and crystallize things a little better. So there's a lot of trial and error. There's a lot of educated guesses. And then it's a matter of at some point you just got to kind of, you know, pound on this thing over and over again. And that's one of the things I think that gets really hard. Um, getting back to your actual question is there's a point where every game is good enough. It works. It plays. The, the, the rules make sense. But a lot of times it's not really done. It's not as fun as it could be, or there's problems here and there, or it's just a little bit clunky or something just isn't as enjoyable and pushing through trying again and again to make that better is really hard. But when you do, it's glorious on the other side. That's where you get these games that are evergreens. Now, these things that are wonderful that everyone talks about playing, you know, Klaus Tuber didn't give up on uh, Slayers of Catan. He pushed until it was perfect. You know, there are, there are some terrible versions I'm sure in his closet somewhere that didn't work. And, <laughs> And that there's a rule I've used a lot and seen in other industries called the 80-20 rule. And it's the idea of no matter what project you're working on, you're going to put 80% of the effort into the last 20% of the game. And you'll put 20% of your effort into the first 80% because that's easy. And that's very true in game design. I'll bump into a lot of prototypes when I'm helping people out or I've even seen some that are like uh, kickstarted things. And I'm looking at it and I sit down and I play it and immediately I'm like, this is at 80. They didn't push. They didn't get to the extra 20 and they need to finish this game. It's not there yet. So that I think is the hardest thing because it's difficult when you hit that wall that is that's some that's some pain ahead of you but it's great on the other side it really is <laughs> so how much do you set and play test a game do you, do you do you ever get to the point where you're like i don't ever want to see this game again ever i'm so <laughs> sick of this game yes uh, every time and that's usually right about when you need to put a little more work in to make it great <laughs> yeah no it's uh, yeah, it's it's true um I will play test games uh, hundreds of times uh, if we need to. Um, it's all a matter of getting the results you need in terms of our players having fun. Do the rules make sense? Is everybody clear on their turns and what, what works and what doesn't? So it, it depends on how long it takes. Some games are super, super fast. Others take a long time. But, yeah, you, you have to test a lot and a lot. And usually, like I would say, that's about what's happening. When I'm getting tired of a game, I know I'm probably getting to that point where it's getting polished really, really good. You're almost there. You're almost at the edge. Mm -hmm. Push mm -hmm. a little bit further and you'll make it. Exactly. Exactly. Somewhere then, over the rainbow. Yeah, hey, there you go. And then one of the, I think, unique things about Fireside, so far you guys haven't used Kickstarter. No, we have not. It's true. And is there any particular reason why you're not using Kickstarter? Well, um, I, I, I realize, you know, everybody doesn't, but it seems like even some of the bigger companies are using Kickstarter. Yeah, no, it's getting it's become even more common, I think, among established publishers, um, which I think is a bit of a mix. I'd be curious what your viewers think, but I know there are some people that don't like it because it's kind of a glorified pre-order for a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And other people don't mind. So, you know, I think that's part of it. I think it's been evolving for a while now. And for us personally, we started Fireside basically with we 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 bet the farm essentially we took our savings and we put it into the company and that worked we made a game that was an evergreen and it's been able to fund a lot of other projects and those fund other projects and stuff so we have we're essentially stable enough that we don't really need Kickstarter in that sense um, now here's the trick though uh, the industry's changed a lot and Kickstarter has changed a lot it used to be that a lot of people doing Kickstarters were losing money because they weren't handling their shipping right or they weren't taking right, yeah. contact all the hours people are getting better about estimating that now it's becoming a little more viable for some companies to do this and some you know individuals if they know what they're doing. Um, the thing for us that's always a bit of a challenge is it's very hard to beat the hype that comes with Kickstarters these days. And that's a bit odd because some of these games deserve it and need to be out there and talked about. And other ones are getting hyped because they're Kickstarters, not because they're good games. And that's kind of frustrating sometimes. But there's no denying it's a PR tool. It's, it's amazing. And that has been the one thing that's tempted us is to get your, the word out about your new game. Getting people involved in the crowdfunding is kind of unprecedented and it's really gotten big. So I'm not going to sit here and say we'll never do one, but we are still able to fund our games and we don't publish unless we think it's going to be a hit. There's nothing in our catalog that's a meh. We, we like everything we do and we believe in it. So that's why we put them out there. And you'll notice compared to other publishers, we don't make as many games as often either. We put a lot of work into our stuff right, yeah. rather than the 10 games a year. And honestly, that's there's multiple reasons for that, which is its own hour long conversation. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. getting back to Kickstarter, um, it ha we haven't needed Kickstarter right now. We're financially stable enough that we don't need it. And when our fans are pretty loyal, they buy our games anyway, and we keep making new fans. But I will say yes to, to uh, it's, it's amazing and a little frustrating when we're out there with our well-published game that we put a lot of marketing dollars in and everyone's talking about some Kickstarter no one's heard of because it's a Kickstarter. So there's an element of that. That PR boost is 
it's hard to get that any other way. So I won't sit here and say never, but we don't have any immediate plans for a Kickstarter, and we don't regret not doing them, really. So hope that answers that question. <laughs> yeah, sure. It does. And the, the interesting thing for me is, speaking of PR, you have done something that I don't think I've ever seen another game company do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And that is, you went out on a tour. <laughs> yes, which yes, I thought did. was a brilliant idea. And of course, that was the Smash and Burn tour that you just wrapped up uh, just uh, about a week ago, maybe. Yeah, got, we got Le- home less than uh, a week. What's today? Wednesday when we're taping this? Uh, it's, Thursday. Uh, Thursday. See, Thursday. that's the problem. I'm also still busy. So yeah, <laughs> I got home four days ago. Yeah, yeah, we got back from that, and that started. Well, officially, it started at Gen Con. We, we hit the road for Gen Con, did Gen Con, and then immediately went into the tour. Um, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, we've actually done multiple tours over the years. Uh, I can't remember when the first one was now. It goes back so far. But we've done um, chunks of the country where Amory and I will get in the van, we'll go out, and we will literally hit as many stores as we can. We'll show off the games. We'll give away promos. We'll talk to the fans. I'll sign games, whatever. And uh, we just hit all the game stores in a certain area. Like, the very first one we ever did was kind of in the south. We hit, like, Georgia, Mississippi things like that uh, even a bit of florida and then we did a mid-atlantic one we did one that was all like uh, uh california and all that we've literally covered almost the entire u.s now with a few exceptions and we try and hit like some of the more well-known stores because we can't hit all of them obviously that's that's not possible but we'll hit the big ones we'll promote it a lot we'll try and get people to turn out um i mean you were there for secret door games that was a heck of a yes. show you know we yeah had, it was uh, it was awesome more- than we could handle. I had to I had to jump from table to table. It was great. And you um, actually added a table. Too. We did. We had to add more tables yeah. for more people. Yeah. I mean, it's great. There's nothing like it in terms of uh, getting to meet our fans. The fans get to meet us. We can get direct feedback on things. And for us, getting to meet those stores is huge because the retailers are such a big part of our business. Getting to walk in and see how they run their store. What's it decorated like? What works for them? What doesn't? Um, what's their hot sellers? What are their uh, fan? What are their, what do the customers want? And just meet these retailers is really neat. A lot of times we'll bump into them at industry shows. There's a couple of uh, you know uh, industry only trade show type things we go to throughout the year, but we don't get to see their store, so they can tell us about what works and doesn't. But it's very different when we walk in and put eyeballs on it um it's it's super fun it is a little exhausting but it is a blast though that's why i thought it was pretty unique actually because just just the 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 fact that you're actually in the stores that you know you're seeing your product you're seeing the people that sell your product Mm -hmm. that you know for lack of a better term will you know will pimp your product to (laughs) that you know the 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 customer so yeah it uh, so how did the idea for that come come about because you had said you had done some previously which i guess i had forgotten if i've known you've done other tours well it's been a while um we we don't do them every year uh we usually have to take a year off honestly because they do eat up a lot of time but um, oh i'm sure yeah. i can imagine right <laughs> imagine living on the road for months and months Go right figure. that's kind of tricky yeah no um some of the very first ones were combined with vacations we would literally just be going somewhere and we're like well as long as we're here let's go say hi to this game store and oh it's just a one-hour drive over here let's go see this game store or whatever and if we um emory and i love road trips anyway so there have been a couple times where we would just be literally driving from texas where we're based to you know like the coast or whatever and along the way we We'd stop and interview game stores, and it got more and more organized as as we got more organized about it. We started planning them ahead of time rather than just dropping by. We started sending out marketing materials and hyping it on you know social media. And the biggest one though was um, back in 2012. Amory had taken a job in San Antonio. We moved down there, and the company um, ended up liquidating all their assets and laying off all their employees. And so we got to a point where she needed to either look for a new job or come on board fireside full time and I needed the help and we had enough capital but it was the kind of thing where if now we're going to have two salaries we need to make sure we're really earning them and legitimately fireside needs to like pay our bills so we decided the only way to do that was to go on tour and we we rented our house we got in the van and we lived on the road for almost 10 months um, hitting over 70 stores this is back in 2013 um, that, that was amazing uh, yes we call that the uh, I think it was called the West by Southwest tour which is a play on the big music festival we have down here the South by Southwest because yeah. we were hitting a bunch of stores in like you know arizona new mexico uh we ended up going up like portland and all that um we crisscrossed the country twice it was crazy uh and just saw millions of stores well not millions i shouldn't say that we saw 70 plus i forget the actual number and met a million cool people though and and played tons of games and that was phenomenal and that really we saw a good payback for that in terms of like we saw increased sales we had a lot stronger communication with retailers and we decided we should do this again, but we couldn't do it that long. So the, the next few tours have been a lot smaller. We did um, uh, one for the Dark Titan, the second Castle Panic expansion. We specifically had never been able to get out to Colorado and Utah because of our roots. So we went ahead and 
made a, spe- a special plan to hit those areas, and we hit um, a dozen or so. I can't remember now. That was uh, was that 2014. Boy, I'm, I'm, we've done this a lot. I'm getting a little fuzzy. <laughs> but anyway, a couple years ago we did that, and then this year was the Smash and Burn, which was more around like the Great Lakes and Ohio kind of area. So, yeah, it's a it's a thing, and it, it it pays off definitely in getting those relationships. But it's a ton of work, no question. <laughs> oh, I can't ima- I can't just imagine just living in hotels for that long and yeah. not seeing home and, you know, mm-hmm. but <laughs> it was, yeah. uh, it's the, at the secret tour games, the one I, w- I was able to go to, it was just amazing to see the like people come in and like, once they kind of figured out who you were, they just like lit up and it's like, Oh my right. God, I love this game. I love right. castle panic or, you know, I, I can't wait to play hot shots or right. it, it, it was, it was amazing to me. Cause you, you could just tell once they, you know, at, at first they thought, Oh, this is just some dude that's going to demo this game for me, <laughs> right, you know? Right. And then it's like, they figured out, Oh my God, this is like the dude, he designed yeah. this. <laughs> yeah. It is. It's fun like that. Yeah. There's always these moments where someone thinks you're just a demo or it's like, no, yeah. I actually made the game. <laughs> what? Yeah. And it's fun because we have people show up to get games signed and stuff and little kids want to meet me and things. It's hilarious. We love it. It's it's awesome to to see the reach our games have had. And, you know, people tell me the stories of how, you know, our, our kids weren't real social. We had a hard time, you know, getting to get their friends. Now they play Castle Panic with their friends on their own all the time. And that stuff just warms your heart. It's awesome to see. And I can't even count how many copies of Castle Panic and uh, Wizard's Tower, I signed this tour. I, I had, we had to buy a Sharpie halfway through the tour. It was awesome. <laughs> but that is just what's so great about this hobby, though, is just how it, it, it brings people together. It, you know, opens people up. Yeah. There's nothing else like it. Yeah, it's, re- it's really great. When it works like, great like that, it is uh, literally magical. Yeah. And then, of course, the Smash and Burn Tour was an awesome play on words for the <laughs> two latest games you have, which is Hot Shots and Kaiju Crush. Yep. So let's let's talk about Hot Shots first. Right that on, right course, on. This is a firefighting game where you are fighting wildfires, mm-hmm. and hence the name Hot Shots. Yep. So how did the idea about Hot Shots come about? Yes, the the burn part of the burn tour. <laughs> hey, like there you yeah. go. That's um, right. It goes back a ways, actually. Um, I was working on that. Uh, I want to say back in two thousand eleven ish, and um, I had an idea for a game that was uh, tile based. That was going to be um, sort of a mm, adventure game kind of thing, and it wasn't really working very well. And then I was inspired because at the time that was when a lot of pressure like dice games were getting really hot. Like zombie dice was big and stuff, and I loved them. But I always had this sense of in a pressure luck game, when you fail, you just lose points. There's no real consequence. You just don't make points. And I, I like that, but I was like, what if there was like an actual consequence? What if things got worse because you pushed your luck, you know, an actual consequence? And I started thinking, like, yeah, something that would, like, get out of control or, like, you were trying to fight it, but it got too big. Oh, kind of like a fire, maybe. Hmm. And that was literally, like, version one of the game was taking the the tile-based idea from the other game that wasn't working and mashing it up with this idea of a pressure like dice game. Um, we cranked away on it. We uh, got a pretty good game going. Even had some cover art drawn up, which is the actual cover art in the game. And then we heard through the grapevine that another publisher was going to be doing a wildfire game, and they were going to get out literally a few weeks to months ahead of us on a, a release. And we just stopped. We're like, no, I don't want to have to explain why my game is different. I don't want to have to have this fight. I don't want to be confused with this game. So we shelved it, and I went on to work on Dead Panic and a bunch of other games. And then late last year, we pulled up, um, well, actually early last year, we pulled up the old game just to see what it was like. I played it, and I was like, oh, it's good, but I could make this better. And so I went back and tweaked the dice engine and changed how the rewards worked and uh, finally solved the problem of fire. I never loved how fire worked in the old game. Now I got it fixed. And... um Polished it, polished it, play tested it, play tested it, play tested it, got sick of it, play tested it some more. And uh, there we go. We ended up with this game. Um, uh, the flame, the fire stuff worked so well. And the more research I did into how hot shots actually fight fires, the more I fell in love with these heroes and just like was amazed at the tools and how they work and started really playing with those things like the way fire can sometimes jump fire breaks. You know, these dirt trenches these guys dig that are meant to stop sparks from flying. Sometimes the wind just, you know, knocks a tree over or it jumps over. They have a thing called crown fires that light and go over we didn't get those in the game we're working on that maybe for an expansion but yeah just all the technology and the tools they use and stuff it was really really fun to dig into that and uh then we just you know did our our job of make sure it works really really good and keep cranking on it yeah i was going to ask if you had plans for an expansion because it was really fun i enjoyed playing it because you know i played it at the uh smash and burn tour and uh, mm-hmm. even even though according to Anne marie we played the longest game ever that you guys yes. had 
I can't believe how long that one went on. Y'all I can't very believe careful. how long it went on either. <laughs> yeah. It's normally much quicker than that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was a case of very bad analysis paralysis on yes. one of the player parts. I, but I did notice that. I, I had a concern early, and I'm afraid I was right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But other than that, a fun game. I loved it. Other than the people I were playing with. Right. Now yeah. you can play it with your own crew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's right. New rule. You can take, like, about 20 seconds to make your decision, right. and then you go. But Exactly, exactly. So, so yeah, do, do you have plans for expansions? I mean, I, I realize it's just, it, it is out now, so it, it is available. Right. It's, it's probably there. a little early like, to be thinking about expansions. Well, yes and no. I mean, you know, as a publisher, that's always a crazy challenge in terms of nine times out of ten, yeah, we've got plans for expansions, but you've got to see if a game has the legs for it because this industry is so twitchy that if, if it doesn't sell well enough, you don't want to throw good money after bad. But I don't think we have that problem with Hot Shots. It's already sold out of our warehouse and stuff, so we've, we know it's moving. It's just a question of um, what the demand's going to be. And yeah, I'll be honest, we have some plans for an expansion. I'm actually uh, tinkering with that. Uh, that's my next project after my current one. Um, and we're, we're kind of also one of the things I love to do is I have ideas when I'm making a game nine times out of ten I do where I think this would make a great expansion but what I love to do is hear from the fans and what they want just in case I'm not scratching an itch they want so that's part of right. it is getting that feedback on ooh what if we could do this in the expansion and like oh let me see if I can make that work you know so we love to get that kind of input and, and really be able to satisfy our fans and give them exactly what they want so yeah I think there's a very very good chance Hot Shots is going to have an expansion like I said I'm not nothing's at press right now but we're we're tinkering <laughs> you but i i think you, you managed to get the pressure luck aspect and the tile aspect and you married them together just perfectly oh thank you to where it you know it, it it's kind of two different games but yet it doesn't feel like two different games if that makes sense right right yeah, and, and a lot of that, too, is to give you the variety. Um, you're you're almost never going to have the same game twice. Either your tiles are laid out differently, or the deck of fire cards that controls how the fire uh, lives and breathes is going to be shuffled up differently. And, man, just two cards coming in a different order can completely change the way the game goes. So there's a lot of replay, and, and I'm really proud of how that came out. It's, it's yeah, it's one of my favorites right now. It's always easy to say that with your newest game, but I'm but very yeah, exactly, proud of it. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> Well, then that was the burn part of the tour. So let's yes. talk about the smack. And that <laughs> is your upcoming game, right. which is Kaiju Crush, which yes. I love that name, by the way. That <laughs> name is amazing. Good. We worked hard on that. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the uh, genesis uh, behind this? Because it is exactly what it sounds like. You were just giant monsters crushing things. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That, it lives up to its name. No false advertising. Exactly. Right. That's right. Yes, yes. So uh, Kaiju Crush is actually a game that was uh, co-designed. Uh, Tim Armstrong brought us a prototype a couple of uh, years ago, and we looked at it, and we said, boy, we really like this game. This is neat. There's some, some good mechanics. It just kind of needs more to it, but let's talk. And we ended up talking. We signed a contract with him, and then he and I went back and forth on what we could do to kind of beef up the game. There were a few elements I wanted to um, kind of like clean up a little bit, and then we both started thinking about, well, what can we do with theme and how can we change this up a bit? And at one point, we finally stumbled, after trying a few other ideas, we came up with this idea of giant monsters. Like, oh my god, this would work perfect, because his original game had a lot of the core concepts that are in it still. You move around from tile to tile and you claim those tiles, you can never go back to those tiles, and your movement is limited by this interesting card play, where your movement card is available to you, and then the movement card that's shared by all the players is available to you, so you have two movement options. You have to follow the, you know, up, down, left, right, whatever the card says, and then when you play yours, it swaps out with the shared one to become the new shared. So he had the bones of that right there already. We ended up tweaking a lot of sort of the secret objectives, the goals. Um, once it became a giant monster game, we had to introduce some fighting to it. So, um, yeah, it, it was one of those things where once we realized it was going to be a city being smashed by giant monsters, it, not that it writes itself, but there, there are boxes you have to check. You know, they got to fight, you got to be able to smash things, and how do you win? What's the, what's the victory conditions that make it interesting? And the fun thing is, there's a lot of strategy in this game. It doesn't look like it at first it seems really really simple and it is to play but to win you've got to be thinking about your positioning of your monster what cards you have access to where's your next move going to be in case someone takes your one spot away and what if you don't have that movement card so exactly very... and that happened to me several times when <laughs> exactly. i was playing in the tour i'm like okay i know what i'm gonna do dang it i can't yep. do that now exactly and sometimes <laughs> being the guy to put the dang it out there is half the fun too <laughs> well exactly yeah. yeah 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 so um yeah that was a really fun one too and that one like 
like I said, the hardest thing there was kind of settling on a theme and then polishing up all the bits that needed to work to support the theme because we really wanted it to feel like a giant monster game, not just to some sort of a puzzle uh, that had giant monsters painted on it. So we kind of played with that. And then, uh, you know, then we get into the art development, which is super fun. We love all the style of the monsters and the kind of top down ish view of the city is really fun. So, um, yeah, that one that one cranked along pretty well. It was it was pretty fun to work on. So I said Hot Shots is available now. Yep. And that's available everywhere at your friendly local game stores. Also, all your online retailers yes. should have yeah. it. Mm-hmm. And Kaiju Crush is going to be available when? November 1st. So not too much longer to wait. It is uh, out there right now being distributed and probably hiding in some stores' back rooms as we speak, waiting for the official OK to start selling it. So, yeah, it's uh, coming soon. <laughs> And then uh, let's talk about some upcoming stuff. I know you probably have some secrets that you can't talk about. Right, but. right. There's always irons in the fire, yeah. Um, <laughs> one of the questions we get all the time is, are we making more Castle Panic expansions? And the answer is, of course, yes. Um, that was going to be my question. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you read exactly. my mind. Yeah, everybody <laughs> wants to know. I mean, I love the fact that that game still gets so much love. That makes me very, very happy. So, yeah, um, it's not going to be our next release. And I'm actually, I, I can't really talk about schedule because what I oh, see yeah. now will be irrelevant in three months probably. But we're working on it. It's definitely going to be a 2018 release uh, uh, unless something crazy happens. Um, So there's another one of those coming. Uh, This one will be... Let me test it before I say much more, but it's going to be interesting. I, I like what we're doing with this one. Um, I think people are going to really dig it because it's going to echo some other stuff that we've done in other games that people have liked. So uh, I'll just leave that out there. And then uh, I'm currently working on another game that we acquired um, from some designers that we are uh, polishing up. This one had to go through a couple of redesigns, so it's a little slow for us right now. And I want to make sure it's as golden as it can be. So I'm in the process of kind of rejiggering a few things, and then we're going to test, test, test to make it right. But that's going to probably be our first big release next year. Um, I will say it's going to have a real-time resource gathering element that we're super excited about, where everyone's rolling dice to get resources, and then you build resources to do stuff. But I'm going to stop before I go much further, because a lot is still changing. So, but um, Spoilers! Yeah, spoilers! Things are going to happen. It's going to be fun, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, it, it scratches a neat itch, and it's also a little different from what we've done before, Nothing too dramatic, but I think it's going to scratch a neat itch for our fans who um, we like to be a li- we like to surprise people now and then, and not just always do you know things you can predict. So I think this will fit that bill very very nicely. And a game you haven't done that I think you should look at, mm-hmm. and it, it, it's kind of right now it seems to be kind of the it game mm-hmm. is why have you never done like a dungeon crawler type? Game? <laughs> That's a classic dungeon crawl. Um, <laughs> honestly, because there's so many of them out there, um, they it, they always look like they do well, but I've seen some numbers that show that there's huge competition, honestly, on dungeon crawls. That they oh, yeah, there's do. there's a ton of them. So yeah. yeah, so it's hard to make yours stand out, and you really do need to do something different. Um, uh, and because of that reason, I don't find them all that terribly interesting. So for me personally, I'm not really driven for them. However, I will say... We've got some ideas in the Castle Panic world that would be really fun to experiment with that we may be doing as sort of standalone games. Um, it's very pre prototype still, so can't really say anything about it. But we've got some ideas that may scratch a little bit of that itch. But, uh, no, nah, it's just... Like I said, it's kind of a, a a bit of one of those ones where you're jumping into a, a big, we'd be another small fish in a very big pool. And unless I can do something really interesting, I don't know if I want to do that. I want to make sure it really jumps out in a fun way, you know. Well, excellent. So I thank you for your time today. You betcha. And we will look forward to, of course, uh, Kaiju Crush coming out uh, right, right now. Hot Shots is out now. So yep. go out and get that. Uh, our review will be coming fairly soon for that. Very cool. But uh, a little spoiler of the review. I love the game. It was so fun. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> and Kaiju awesome. Crush, too. But, yeah. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Very good. <laughs> yeah. So um, thanks once again. You bet. Thank you. This is a pleasure to, to be on here.